much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, especially for you to uh, have given up such a glorious afternoon to hear us speak today. What I want to tell you about is some of the work that's been going on in the Center for Visual Science. This is a group of about 32 faculty members that I uh, direct uh, here at the University of Rochester. Uh, we focus on all different aspects of vision. I'm only going to be able to tell you about a very narrow slice of uh, all the work that's going on in vision science here at Rochester. I've been at Rochester for 32 years, and the reason I've spent my entire scientific career here is because Rochester offers some advantages that you can't find anywhere else, as I'm sure um, almost everybody in this, this audience appreciates for different reasons. The reason I think Rochester is so wonderful is we have this very close proximity proximity between our engineering school and the School for Medicine and Dentistry, and that allows us to collaborate on innovative scientific projects that you couldn't really do anywhere else in the planet. And I want to give you some examples of some of those collaborations today. Okay, so the brain. The human brain is a tantalizing mystery. We don't understand how it works. We've made enormous progress in trying to understand how it works, but major mysteries about how the brain codes information and allows us to see and hear and feel and think uh, are, uh, remain a, uh, largely a major mystery. One of the main reasons why it's a mystery is because the brain con consists of maybe 10 billion cells. And each of those cells, on average, communicates with about 10,000 other cells. So in the lower right here, you see uh, an example of the complexity that we have to deal with. The way we've been trying to chart through this, uh, this uh, tissue to try to understand how it works has largely been done with a single microelectrode recording from one of those 10 billion cells at a time. And what's really needed are methods that allow us to look at large numbers of cells simultaneously so that we can figure out how they're talking to each other. How are, they, how are these circuits of different cell classes uh, intertwined in such a way as to generate the complexity of thought that we all take for granted uh, uh, every day of our lives? Well, the, the tack that we've been taking on this problem at Rochester is not to look at the brain per se, or at least this part of the brain, but to look at a different part of the brain, the retina, which resides inside your eyes. The retina is a part of the brain, it's part of the central nervous system, and it's simpler than the whole brain and offers some hope that if we can understand how that circuit works, we'll have some insight into the general principles that the brain uses in order to compute stuff. So here you can see an eye, and one of the nice advantages of working in the eye is that it has a natural window that allows you to look at a part of the central nervous system directly. So if we do a fly-through into this eye, you can see what I mean. Here's a one centimeter square, and just for scale, that's the uh, retina you're looking at now, where the retinal image is cast. We've developed at Rochester a technology to look at this retina in a way that no one's ever been able to see it in the living eye before. Here's a very high magnification view of the retina obtained with a conventional camera, commercial camera for taking pictures of the inside of the eye, at a scale at which single cells ought to be visible. You can't see the single neurons in the retina with this technology because the resolution isn't good enough. Well, we've developed a camera based on technology borrowed from astronomy that they use for taking very sharp pictures of, of very faint stars, and we can create a new view of the same structure you're looking at here that looks like this, where we can now see uh, all the rods and cones, the photoreceptors in the retina, uh, upon which the retinal image is cast, and that uh, provide the first step, the first neural step in vision, because these cells absorb light, convert that light into an electrical signal that ultimately makes it to the brain. So the first step in studying the uh, the retina in a novel way and understanding its circuitry is this uh, unique capability we have here at Rochester to look at the retina in a living eye non-invasively at very high resolution. What we'd like to understand is what is the code that the retina uses to talk to the brain? The retina takes the retinal image, converts it into a set of neural signals, and those neural signals then go up to the brain where they're interpreted and, and processed further. What is that code that's being used to send signals from the, from the retina of the brain? The problem in answering that question is the same problem I alluded to at the outset. If you go poking around with a single electrode recording electrical currents in the retina, you'll never get there. There are 1.2 million optic nerve fibers, output neurons, in each eye. We need a technology that allows us to look at many neurons simultaneously if we're going to understand what that code is. Well, fortunately, molecular biology 
is in the, in the middle of a revolution. You probably have heard about this. Genetic engineering is um, making progress by leaps and bounds. We've um, managed to sequence the human genome. We now even have the capability to take a single cell of one species, remove the genetic material, put in a, a new set of genetic material, and change the species of that cell. People are beginning to talk about actually creating new life forms using this technology. It's a little bit frightening but the possibilities for healthcare are enormous. So we're trying to capitalize on that technology here at Rochester and those developments in order to understand the circuitry of the retina. And the way we do it is this. We make a very uh, 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 simple injection into the eye, and you can see the eye here, and the, that green stuff there is some of the fluid that we inject. But it's not just quite as simple as that. It's a little cleverer than that. What we're actually injecting is a virus into the eye. It's a virus that's completely benign. It doesn't do anything harmful to the eye. It's in our bodies all the time anyway. But what that virus has been, uh, it's been modified in a way so that it actually has the genetic machinery in it to make molecules that glow when they're illuminated with light. So what we can do is inject this virus into the uh, eye and it um, goes and infects these cells that we want to, these output neurons that we want to study, and they're shown uh, at the bottom of the slide here in this cross section of the retina. Those, those sort of um, purplish cells there are, are the output neurons called the ganglion cells that send the signals up to the brain. And when we do this, the cells glow. So we get these beautiful views of these ganglion cells, these output neurons in, in a living mouse eye by using our high-resolution imaging technology invented here at Rochester, coupled with this new uh, um, technology available through genetic engineering. So not only can we make these cells glow like this, we, we can also get them to glow in a way that's different depending on how active the cells are. When they're more active, they send uh, larger signals to the brain. When they're less active, they're sending uh, weaker signals to the brain. So we can actually monitor optically, using light, what these cells are telling the brain in real time in a living mouse while the mouse is seeing the world. So that's exciting, uh, exciting enough. And here's an example, I think, uh, from a work of my collaborators, Bill Merrigan and Lou Yin, where uh, we've uh, circled a bunch of these cells. And um, we can go in, and here's, a, here's some of them. Uh, we can look at hundreds of cells at one time. I'm just showing you six. And the important thing to note here is looking on the left of the slide, see how that image gets brighter over time? It's getting brighter when we're de delivering a flash of light to the retina. So we're able, again, to optically monitor the signals that the retina is sending to the brain while the eye, eye of a living animal is seeing. Very exciting. But that's a basic science application. You might be wondering, is there some medical application of this technology that might help people? Is there some way that we can use this, for example, to restore vision in the blind? Here's a cross-section of the retina taken with a the, with the light microscope, showing all the different layers of that tissue, that part of the brain, as I mentioned, but now residing in the back of the eye. And you probably know there are a host of diseases called um, generally retinal degenerations. The one you're probably most familiar with is macular degeneration, age-related macular degeneration, which some of your relatives may well be suffering from. It's a very devastating disease. One in 10 people over 65 will be getting that, uh, will, has that disease, and we're expecting a doubling in the prevalence of that disease uh, in the next uh, 20 years as a result of the aging of our population. So this is a very important disease to try to find some way uh, of fixing and curing. So the idea is this. What, if, what happens in retinal degenerations generally is that these, these, um, the layer of cells there where the, where the red text is, those are the photoreceptors, the rods and cones. And those are the cells that are damaged, destroyed really, by macular degeneration or other kinds of retinal degenerations. Well, what if we could somehow change the way the retina works and make those output neurons we've been studying, what if we could make those intrinsically light sensitive? They're not normally sensitive to light directly. They just get electrical signals from the rods and cones. But what if we could make the output neurons uh, light sensitive? Well, fortunately, this same molecular genetic engineering approach, uh, modified slightly, can be used to do that. And the idea is illustrated here where you're seeing a single neuron. We insert the ge genetic machinery to make these cells intrinsically light sensitive. So these little green spots, you see like measles all over that cell, those are little pores that are sensitive to light. 
when you illuminate those pores, the neuron fires. So whereas before I showed you a way that allows us to actually uh, monitor cells in living eyes, now we have a way of controlling them with this optogenetics approach. And just to show you that this actually has some potential, here's an example in a mouse in which um, this mouse has not been treated with this special injection, and it's blind. And you can see it's trying to find the, the way out of this water maze. It's swimming around. Mice don't like to swim. And um, very rarely, and, only, and just by chance, will make it to the, the, the part of the maze where there's light, and that's, that's the part that it will exit. But most of the time, the mouse, unfortunately, because it's blind, flounders, flounders around and can't make its way to the right place. However, if you treat the animals with this uh, injection, of this stuff called channel rhodopsin, the mouse immediately goes, learns to immediately go to the right direction. So it's regained sight. A blind mice, mouse has regained sight and is now able to solve this task. We're using this method here at the University of Rochester. We have people who are very skilled, not only at simple tasks, at understanding simple tasks like this that animals can do, but we can learn more about what animals can and cannot see that almost anyone, el anyone else in any other university um, in the United States or in the world for that matter. And we're very excited about using this uh, as a method for vision restoration uh, in the future in cases of macular degeneration and so on. So I've told you about a couple of different technologies now that are available to transform the way that we understand how the brain works so that we can look at large numbers of cells simultaneously and we can not only listen to those cells and hear what messages they're conveying to their, their neighbors, but we can also control those cells so that we can send our own signals into the nervous system if we want to. Now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with um, the sort of common actor that you find in science fiction stories, whether they be movies or um, or books, the cyborg, right, where a cyborg is a creature, part human, part machine, that allows uh, information to flow from the machine to the human and, and back and forth. This technology that, I ha that we all have in our, most of us have, if your parents have bought you one, uh, in, your, um, in your pocket allows you to get a pretty large fraction of the wealth of knowledge in, in, in humankind at your fingertips already. I mean, this is a remarkable technical innovation. The next step, logically, and I'm not saying this will happen tomorrow, it won't, but the next logical step is to get that information directly into the nervous system. And what you might actually be seeing in these developments I talked about today of being able to communicate with neurons in a two-way communication, both listening and talking to neurons, may actually be the first uh, baby steps toward the ability for machines and humans to, uh, to communicate directly in the future. Now, um, uh, that, that could be a scary thought for some of you. It could also be a very uh, liberating thought if that technology is used in a wise and ethically sound way. And I think um, the future is, is very bright. This technology that, that I talked about, this optogenetics method, is already being used in in, in uh, animal models to, to show that you can control obsessive compulsive behavior, Parkinson's disease, depression, and an anxiety using these methods that use light as the basic way to communicate with the nervous system. So we may have found the way to interface with the nervous system, to get computers and, and uh, the nervous system to talk together, and I think it's, it's a very exciting future we have before us. Uh, if you think I'm dreaming, uh, what my father used to say is, only the dreamer is awake. Thank you.